Happy Friday, everybody. It is a beautiful October the 13th. We are closing in on Halloween and then comes Christmas. Uh, this is my favorite time of the year. I've said this on pretty much every podcast in the last couple of episodes that I love fall and I'm going to keep repeating it because fall rocks. And uh, today is awesome because we got Dan Templin with us from um, Dan. I didn't even ask what business you want me to re reference, but the businessman Dan.com is where you can find him. Uh, Dan, why don't you just jump in here? What is the business that you're from? Sure. Uh, we have a handful of different businesses. We have a handful of short-term rentals. We have single family rentals. We actually own a bar and restaurant too. Um, That's fun. And we have different um, services for helping people put um, short-term rentals into their multifamily properties. So we've got a lot going on over here. Um, and Funny enough, I didn't even realize it was Friday the 13th until you just said that it was Friday <laughs> and then you said it was the 13th. So that's a good point. That. <laughs> People are going to be watching Halloween today. Right. Yeah. Um, right on. Well, yeah, I mean, you got a lot of experience, uh, mixed use commercial, short term rentals, um, bars, I guess. So you got it all over the place. And I love that because it means we can we can go into a lot of different areas. We can talk about a lot of things. Um, before we get into that, why don't we go into your story? I told you, you know, right before we got on here, we like to start with stories. We like to hear how people got to where they are today. So, um, why don't you take us back to the beginning of your story? How'd you get started in real estate? Sure. So, uh, my wife and I met at Michigan state university and we bought our first house for, uh, $15,000 and we rehabbed it with the help of my father-in-law and my parents and a lot of um, free labor from them. And we, um, I was working a corporate job at that point and we sold that and we made like $70,000 on it. And All we right. used that money to go and buy a dive bar in my local hometown. And after we did that, it's hard to get a restaurant up and going, especially one that so, was dilapidated. I'm going to jump in here real quick. Why was the dive bar your first choice? Uh, so originally the game plan, my wife went to school for education and I was, um, running, I don't know if you're familiar with Joseph A. Bank men's clothing store. Mm -hmm. Um, but they sell suits, ties, all that type of stuff. And so I was the general manager there and they, uh, our schedules would just be completely opposite. And we saw exactly how our lives were going to be and we were never going to see each other. So we decided, um, we wanted to work for ourselves. Uh, I came from a family where, my father was an entrepreneur, my mother and um, her dad was an entrepreneur. My dad's father was an entrepreneur. And so it was in my blood. And I knew I wanted that freedom that came along with working for yourself. And so literally the day after my wife graduated from college, uh, we got the keys to the restaurant. So, oh, wow. Um, why why but, did you choose to invest in a restaurant, though? Uh, it's kind of funny how it happened. We we're talking about wanting to work for ourselves and the restaurant came up at a price uh, that we could actually afford. And it kind of just fell into our lap. Um, we heard about that. It was for sale through the grapevine. We knew we could do good things with it. And so it was the first reasonable opportunity that came to us. And that's what we took. Nice. Yeah. I, uh, I always kind of um, not kind of romanticize, I guess, owning a bar or a restaurant. Uh, but I do know that it is very hard to actually run them. Um, yes, so, absolutely. You know, after you bought it, did you, you know, what'd you guys do from there? So that was us working, you know, 70, 80, 90 hours a week, um, both of us together. And then we had our first kid. And so my wife um, pretty much stepped into that role after about five years. And I looked around one day after I had, um, after we had my daughter and I was like, I can't continue to do this. And so we always wanted to get back to real estate because, you know, our first deal that we did was so great for us. It's just, we never had the capital. And once we started making enough money at the restaurant, we started hiring more and more support staff. And now we're at a point to where I have a general manager and I literally spend maybe 15 minutes a week on the restaurant. Um, and we have a great staff in place that does a really good job. And we have a lot of KPIs in place, you know, to keep track of everything going on there. And um, we started investing 
And we started with a multifamily, a little fiveplex, and we decided, you know, we should get some Airbnbs going because we heard a lot of people doing really well with them. There weren't really a lot in our area. And once we did that, I mean, that was life changing for us from a cash flow perspective. Um, and so now we have we have seven active right now. Um, and we look to continue to grow that. Nice. Um, yeah. And what area are you in again? Uh, we're in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Cool. Um, so Kalamazoo, I don't have it pulled up, but I know it's not, you know, it's not a Los Angeles. It's a small. Oh no. Yeah, it is. Um, it is definitely not a major market. Um, and actually where our restaurant is, is only a population of like 2000 people. It's about an hour South of Kalamazoo. Um, Mm -hmm. so we definitely like to focus in areas where there's not a lot of competition and there's still a lot of upside, but not nearly as much um, barrier of entry to get into. So yeah, let's uh, let's kind of talk a little bit more about that because um, you know one of my buying criteria is the metro needs to be at least fifty thousand plus. Mm-hmm. Um, but I I've actually seen great success. I you know I bought outside of that specific buying criteria just because great deals fall in my lap and I'm like, well, I can't pass this up. Sure. Um, but I bought in towns that are like 2000, 4000 and they actually turned out to be really good. Um, so, you know, smaller towns are mostly overlooked by investors. Um, and if you're coming from a coastal city where the average house price is 300,000, 400,000, um, and you, you aren't able to buy in your local area, you know, some of the smaller Midwestern towns are great because the price points are so low. Um, Mm -hmm. what are, I guess, what are the things that you look for when you're looking to buy in these smaller metros? Uh, it depends on what type of property we're looking to get. Um, so we buy single family rentals and long-term rent them. Um, and for that, we're looking for, um, medium priced homes, three bath or three bedroom, two bath. And we feel like this, those are kind of our safe bet properties, right? Like we know they're going to appreciate over time. We know they're not going to cash flow a ton, maybe three to five to $700 a month. Um, if we get lucky with some bonus equity, but, um, so that's what we're looking for with single family, but for Airbnbs, you're looking for at least a 20 to 30% cash on cash return. Um, and it's, much easier to cash flow in a market with lower um, barriers to entry, you know, lower price point. And if there's hotels in your area, people are traveling in your area and there's a lot of upside to opening an Airbnb versus opening or, you know, just having a traditional rental. And I do both and I believe in both, but I think it's good to have a good mix of cash flow and um, of safety. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and when you're underwriting Airbnbs, um, just because you're buying it as an Airbnb doesn't mean that you can't fall back to a long-term rental. Um, Absolutely. You know, house, house, you can do yep. whatever you want with it. Yeah. And um, you know, everyone's talking about the Airbnb bubble right now. Um, but I think that's mostly kind of just dramatized through the media because people who are buying in markets that were too hot and bought at too high of a price, um, when there was really a huge boom, they were doing fine. But now that things came back, I think it's just a reality check instead of living in a fantasy land because our Airbnbs are still doing great. Um, we're still killing it in all of our properties. And if something did happen, like you said, back to your point, we could fall back on putting them on single family, just traditional rentals and still cash flow just fine. I mean, it wouldn't be anything like what we're cash flowing now, but it's a safe investment. So, yeah. Um, but I mean, the, the downside for those kind of markets is you don't really get the appreciation that you would in, you know, coastal cities and right. major markets that are absolutely, that it's always a trade off between cash flow and appreciation. And, um, part of the reason that we like to do median priced homes is because those do tend to capture the most amount of appreciation. A lot of times, you know, if you're buying like the house I live in, uh, you know, 4,500 square foot, six bedroom house. It's, it has the potential for great appreciation, but it also has a lot more downside if the market drops. And so there's a lot more risk there when you're looking at investment. Yeah. Um, so let's talk 
numbers real quick. Uh, so you are, you know, you're looking in Michigan um, mm-hmm. and anywhere in that, you know, the greater, greater lakes area, you can find pretty reasonably priced homes. Absolutely. What, uh, what are you looking for? Like, what's your entry point um, in terms of a, a buy price? And then what are you generally looking for in terms of uh, gross revenue from an Airbnb perspective? Okay. So from an Airbnb perspective, um, we have actually a lot of different types of properties. Um, and my favorite kind of niche is to buy small multifamilies and put them on Airbnb. So like downtown quads. Uh, quads, we have, we don't have a quad. We have two duplexes and we have one fiveplex. Mm-hmm. And in that fiveplex, two of them are on Airbnb. Three of them are not. Mm-hmm. Um, the duplexes kind of are my favorite. Um, so for example, downtown Kalamazoo here, we bought a old Victorian that's in the central business district. There's not really any other houses around it. It's more of a commercial area. And in that property, we bought it for, man, I think that we bought it for three twenty five. dollars um, instantly got an appraisal on it at um, $399, which is great. We're always looking for bonus equity. And that's grossing about $105,000 a year. And so, I mean, after you have, you have more expenses, you know, with a short-term rental versus a long-term rental. So you have cleaning fees in there, which are about $20,000 a year. Um, And then your normal debt service, you're also responsible for utilities, which you're not with, you know, a traditional rental. Um, But that property, I mean, it just kills it. Uh, from what we put down, um, the cash on cash on that, I would have to look, but it's definitely over our threshold of what we're looking for. I think it's around like 35, 40%. Wow. That's great. Um, and your, what is the, the OPEX ratio for, um, short-term rent rentals is it usually about 50%. I, it kind of depends on the market that you're in. Um, I, I think that that's not a bad threshold, but yeah yeah it'll depend um cool so for somebody who wants you know like myself i I don't own any short-term rentals but it always seems cool we in fact we uh we drove up to a small town here in washington um because we just wanted to buy a house on the on the beach and we couldn't really justify just having an empty house so we were looking for short-term rentals Um, we didn't end up pulling the trigger but i've wanted to buy one um for someone just getting into short-term rentals what are the tips that you know, going into it originally when you you know first bought your first one that you didn't know um, kind of jumped up out of nowhere. Sure, um, I th- it didn't happen to me, but I've seen it happen to a lot of people, and it's regulations. You, mm. a lot of people go into a market and they're like, "Oh, there's no regulations on short term rentals here. We're good to go." That's actually one of the worst scenarios that you can buy a short term rental in, because if the oh, local yeah. government decides, you know. Hey, we haven't addressed this. We're getting complaints. Now we need to address it. Your asset that was an awesome asset that was cash flowing amazing could all of a sudden lose 30% of its value. And we've seen that happen a lot um, on the coastal city, uh, calm coastal, but on great um the Great Lakes here. So the little towns, you know, on Lake Michigan, people go in and there was a feeding frenzy for properties and properties that were going, you know, for 700,000 were going for a million and people were killing it on Airbnb. And then the city steps in and they're like, or the county, and they're like, you know what? We're not going to allow short term rentals anymore. And those houses now are going for 600,000 because people just need to get out of them because they can't cash flow on a traditional rent on them and they can't afford to hold them without renting them. So I, I think that's the biggest thing that you need to look at. You need to make sure that there is regulation in place that's favorable and that there's not a lot of drama around short-term rentals in the market you're going into because you don't want something drastic to change. Yeah. Yeah. That is, um, and that's something that's, you know, that's really out of your control, um, when it comes to, you know, looking at the variables that you have control over when you're going into an investment right. is, uh, is what the local municipality is going to do about it. So and there are 
There are a couple states now that at a state level, they've guaranteed the rights of property owners to do whatever they want with their property. And that's going through legislature in Michigan right now. And so that would actually pull all the local restrictions um, and make it so that they weren't allowed to restrict that. And so I'd recommend if it's your first one and you're going to make a significant investment, go to a state where at the state level, they said that you are guaranteed the right to do that. Hmm. That's interesting. Um, do you know which states, you know, have that in place already? I off the top of my head, I don't Probably know Texas, the exact right? list. Of, yeah, Texas is one of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You'd think. Um, nice man. Well, so Airbnbs, you're crushing it. Uh, how about are you guys still doing stuff in the commercial side? Are you still going out there looking for bars, um, buying stuff like that? Uh, we're not looking to add more restaurants. Um, it, like you said, it can be tough running a restaurant and the startup phase um, to get a restaurant going and to put management in place, I think would take about a year to get everything kind of smoothed out. And so that's not something I'm looking to add more of. Um, we are looking at opening a laundromat um, okay. and buying commercial space for that. And other commercial space that we have is um, is office buildings, um, office space. And then above that is actually Airbnbs. So, Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. I've, uh, I've looked at that model myself before. I've also looked at opening a, a, a laundromat. Um, they're surprisingly hard to find on market. Uh, laundromats go pretty quickly once they, they are. It's because they're cash cows. <laughs> yeah. And sure. not a lot of, of uh, daily operational work. So, yeah. Cool, man. Um, well, that wraps up the main section. It is time to jump into the quick question round. Are you ready? I'm ready. Let's do it. Starts with books or any form of education. I need two recommendations. One for general life wisdom and then one for real estate specific. I mean, for general life wisdom, I would say Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich. I think that's a great mindset book. Um, it really kind of changes how you look at life. Um, and for real estate, man, I think that even though I'm not like a truest with the Burr method, the Burr book, um, I think by David Green at Bigger Pockets is a great book and you can you can implement pieces out of that book. You don't necessarily have to, you know, follow exactly the whole formula. Um, but it's a great way to get into investing and to get your initial capital back. Yeah. Yeah. The Burr is uh I mean you can do that with any any asset. It doesn't even have to be a single family house. So right. Um, yeah. Great. Great suggestions. Uh, that moves us to the next question. This is for your younger self. So let's go back to the Dan who just saw that bar come on the market, um, was considering buying it. Go back to him, look him in the eye, give him one piece of advice moving forward. I would tell him to go right into real estate and I'd probably tell him to start out as a real estate agent. Hmm. If I wanted to work for myself, uh, there's a lot um, less capital that you need to invest up front and there's hmm. a lot higher upside um, and I'm not up like I like because it's I'm very proud of where we're at now. And I just think that we could have gotten here quicker if we would have chosen a different route. So yeah. 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 Hindsight's 2020, right? It is. <laughs> I uh I mean, most people that come on the show, I ask the same question, and the vast majority of them will say they wish they got started sooner. Um, and that's the same for me. I didn't get started in real estate until I mean, really, I didn't get started until 2020. I, I did a few flips before then, but I didn't like really focus in on it until just a couple of years ago. And I always think like, man, if I just done that, if I, you know, become a real estate agent right when I got out of high school, even I, you can do that when you're going to college. Right. Absolutely. It would have made a, would have made a great, great big difference. Um, yeah. So you're not an agent now. Do you have a reason not. for why you're not uh, adding that to your tool, tool belt or? I, I mean, I've got a lot of different businesses going and mm -hmm. I, you know, you only it's so just time. not. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. being an agent, you know, you have to give your customers the appropriate amount of time and you have to put in the effort. And it's something we've definitely talked about doing, but it's not anything that's on the immediate docket. Yeah. Yeah. I've, uh, I've registered for that, that test like three times <laughs> so far. <and> I <laughs> just haven't done it. It's just, it's just, takes a lot of time. Um, I know yeah. there's upside, but like there's so much you can do without being an agent in real estate that it's definitely not necessary. Right. Absolutely. 
All right, you do next- save some on commissions though when you're moving properties, which is nice. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Next question is about the U.S. It's a big place, a lot of opportunity. Give me the single city, the single metro you're most excited about investing in today. Man, I love our local market. Honestly, the um, the investment back into our community is huge. Um, there's something called the Kalamazoo Promise, which uh, the donors have never been actually um, named, but it guarantees uh, college for anyone that goes through the Kalamazoo Public Schools, and so that's a huge investment oh, wow. in our community. Oh yeah, and and the donors the, uh, remained anonymous. Yeah, uh, wow. we have Pfizer and Stryker, and both wow. of those large companies in town. And so, you know, there's speculation on who that was, and um, another private individual just pledged. I think it was like 550 million dollars to build a stadium downtown which is you can see from my airbnb which is awesome um hmm. that's gonna be a huge boom to property values down there and it's just really exciting to see people who have been extremely successful to put it back into their community especially since it's such a small tight-knit community it's um i really like watching it grow and continue to succeed Nice. Yeah, that is the uh, um, the ultimate kind of recognition that you've got to where you're you want to be is that you're able to give back um, to the people that that helped you get you there. Right. For sure. Awesome. All right. Next question is about your business. Uh, the people we work with form the foundation of our business. Um, so we're not talking about the specific people, but we're talking about positions. What were the first three positions you hired for in your business? And, uh, if you did, if you recreated your business today, would you hire them in the same order, hire their positions in the same order today? I think that, um, I'm not sure if, do you know who Dan Martell is? Mm, It rings a bell, but uh, so he, he really focuses on hiring and how to, instead of being like an operator, being a, um, like acting like a CEO and, I haven't done this yet, and I think that I'm going to implement it very soon, but he says that the first thing that you should hire is a personal assistant that pretty much takes control of your inbox and your schedule, and he um, preaches that you need to track how much time you're spending doing things, and if I had to go back, I think that's the first thing that I would have hired out, and this is talking about the real estate business. At the restaurant, obviously, I had to hire waitresses. um, Yeah right away and i had to hire cooks and all that stuff but real estate wise i think that's that that would be the first thing that i would do um right now i have vas i have cleaners i have um property manager um but if i was gonna go back i definitely think it would be a personal assistant for my um specifically my inbox and my schedule nice yeah and if you don't have you know the money to support someone full time, full salary for the year. You can start out with the VA, just like yourself. Absolutely, um, yeah. You know, VAs, I've I've got a ton of them, and they do wonders for for saving your time. And so, uh, it's definitely definitely a great first first hire is a personal assistant or VA. Um, all right, next question is about finding deals. It all starts with getting in contact with the seller. So, what is your favorite way to find good deals? I think that it's one of the most basic ways and people look at me like I'm crazy when I tell them this, but tell people that you're in real estate now, you know, tell people that you're looking for deals because you never know where a great off market deal is going to come your way. You could have talked to someone a year and a half ago and, you know, you get a phone call, Hey, my nephew, you know, yada, 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 yada and is looking to sell this and can't because of X. And so you got you just have to put the word out there that you're actively looking for real estate. And yeah, a lot of times maybe nothing will come of those leads, but they come in a lot and you'd be yeah. surprised what comes through. Yeah. Yeah. It is crazy how, uh, yeah, lead or deals come from everywhere. You can, you know, you can be focusing all your attention on direct mail or something, and then you get a couple deals that weren't even in response to the direct mail. It's just right. Like yeah. Out in, out in left field. Um, so yeah, that is, uh, that's great. Just, I guess that's just in the bucket of make yourself be known, give yourself a brand, start talking about what you're doing. Yeah. Um, good advice. Next question is about lessons learned. Uh, not everything is roses. Sometimes, you know, shit hits the fan and, uh, we got 
we got to figure it out and learn from it. So what is the biggest lesson you learned through a deal gone bad? I think so if you're doing traditional um, single family, it's proper vetting of your tenants. Oh, yeah. tenants. oh you tenants. Yes, because we we've always had pretty good luck, but we've gotten really bit a couple times. And when that happens, um, that teaches you another lesson that you need to make sure that you're capitalized enough to you know, go two or three months without that property. You need a SWAN account, a sleep well at night account. And so even if you vet um, the best that you can, things can still happen in their life and you have to make sure that that's not going to negatively affect your business. I mean, it's going to negatively affect your business, but not to a point to where it puts you into a bind. So yeah. those two things combined, I would say are, yeah. Yeah. Big ones. Um, and what, what are, I guess the top two things that you do to, to vet your tenants? Uh, so we use rent ready. Um, mm -hmm. it's an online software and you can search for past evictions. You can run a full um, report on them and then actually verifying their income. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, that is big. All right. That brings us to the very last question. This is for the listeners. I'm sure people want to reach out, get in contact with you, learn a little bit more about what you guys are doing out there. So what is the best way for people to reach out? Uh, they can visit thebusinessmandan.com or they can send me a DM on Instagram at thebusinessman underscore Dan. Perfect. I'll put that links in the show notes. So if y'all want to reach out to Dan, just click a little more in the description. It'll pull down the full description and there you can find his links. All right, man, that wraps it up. Thank you very much for hopping on the show. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Absolutely. For everybody who's here with us today, thank you guys for showing up. You are the reason we do this. So if you guys have any questions whatsoever, reach out to me, Gabe, at the real estate investing club.com. And if you guys want to support the show, all we ask, give us a like, subscribe, share, all that jazz. Other than that, hope you guys have a great week. Keep rocking real estate. And I look forward to seeing you on the next episode.